I would like to welcome everyone to the Detroit Green Stormwater Infrastructure Virtual Tour. Um, my name is Elaine Elliott, and I am with Sierra Club Michigan Chapter, and I'm co-presenting today with my colleague from Friends of the Rooch. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Hakula. Uh, I'm a restoration coordinator uh, with Friends of the Rouge, uh, and I'm happy to be here today talking with you all about green stormwater infrastructure. Awesome. And for those of you joining us in the webinar, um, we are collecting questions via the Q&A feature. So as you have questions throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to drop them in, um, and we will make sure we get to them during the presentation. And with that, I will pass it to Jackie to talk about our watershed. Wonderful. So we are very fortunate, uh, especially here in Michigan, surrounded by the Great Lakes, to have 20% of the world's fresh surface water available to us. So with this great, wonderful resource comes responsibility from all the residents uh, across these watersheds. So a watershed is uh, the area of land that collects all the water when it rains um, and then has it run off into a local stream, creek, lake, um, and then some. So here is a map of our watersheds of Southeast Michigan. Um, the one in yellow here is the Rouge River watershed, uh, which Friends of the Rouge represents. Um, in our work. Um, and as you can see, uh, all the water um, from the Southeast Michigan watershed communities ends up all in the same place, um, into the Detroit River, um, which then flows into Lake Erie. And of course, all the Great Lakes are connected. So what's the issue with this? So large areas of our urban Southeast Michigan are covered in hard or what we like to refer to as impervious surfaces. Um, so an impervious surface uh, is one that doesn't allow water to infiltrate naturally like it would if it was um, an all natural landscape. So when it rains, the water is then flowing across these hard surfaces uh, to our nearby um, stormwater systems, catch basins, or even the river itself. Um, and with that comes everything else that ends up on our streets, parking lots, and roofs um, that can end up in our waters that we don't necessarily want. So that can include oils from our cars on the roads, um, salt when we're trying to get rid of all of that um, ice in the winter, um, lawn chemicals, uh, fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that can run off um, from your lawn um, into these bodies of water as well. Um, up here we have a, um, a nice little simple diagram of impervious, uh, meaning the water's running right off, um, versus the pervious, uh, where the water is going directly down into the ground like it's supposed to. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Wonderful. So uh, one of the biggest issues is that pollution that we're receiving um, and that ends up in our natural bodies of water. So non-point source pollution, um, meaning not coming from a single source, like you would see like a factory dumping um, their pollution directly into a river. Um, instead, it's non-point source. So that means across the entire watershed landscape, um, which includes mostly residential homes, um, like you see kind of in this uh, photo here with a home, with a roof, um, with sidewalks and a nearby road. Um, so all of that water is running off of those hard surfaces, going into our storm drains. Um, and in the case of uh, some of our communities, especially uh, the city of Detroit, um, they have what's called a combined sewer system. So that is taking both stormwater from the road and all of those hard surfaces, like parking lots, um, everything going into the storm drain outside, as well as all the water that we use within the home as well. So if we're washing dishes, taking a shower, using the restroom, that water goes down 
And all of that water uh, from both inside and outside goes to one single pipe. Uh, so in the case of heavy rains, um, those pipes can easily overfill um, to capacity. Um, so to prevent um, switch backups in people's homes, um, there is a regulator uh, that allows discharge or a combined sewer overflow um, directly into the uh, into our rivers um, instead. Um, so unfortunately, this can create um, a health hazard. Um, you know, just thinking of like E. coli, other bacteria, and things that we don't really want in the water um, can end up there during heavy rains. So, how do we? you know, try to manage this rain uh, to help keep our communities healthy. And this slide uh, is a continuation, kind of showing um, how we can all contribute um, negatively or positively to our watersheds. Um, like we said, all of our water does end up eventually into Lake Erie. Um, there's a small photo there um, with a hand kind of in some really thick green water, um, which is actually an algal bloom, um, which happens as a result of too much um, nutrients in the water. So mostly things from like our lawn care chemicals and fertilizers that run off um, and end up in the lake. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Elaine to talk more about what green what green stormwater infrastructure is and how it can kind of help solve some of these problems we're having. Perfect. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so when we talk about green stormwater infrastructure, we're talking about ways that we can use nature to manage some of our stormwater. And that's particularly important in Detroit, where we do have a lot of impervious surface and we also um, have a combined sewage overflow system. So as much water as we can capture from those impervious surfaces and um, process or uh, use nature to help that water infiltrate back into our ground water system, the better we are. So an example of some common GSI installations that you may see, um, sometimes it's as simple as a downspout disconnection. So if your downspout is not running into the pipe that is along the side of your house, you have GSI at home. And that's a great way to prevent that water from ending up in Detroit, especially in our combined sewage overflow system um, and onto your lawn, which is better than it going directly into the sewer system or even flowing onto a driveway or a sidewalk, for example. Um, another example that we're going to take a close look at today is rain gardens. So rain gardens are um, beautiful installations. Sometimes you can't even tell what their function is, but they collect water typically from roof from roofs, um, and they use plants, native plants. Um, in the case of the gardens, we'll be talking about today to help infiltrate the water that comes off of that roof. Um, and then similarly, you might see larger bioretention projects, and we're going to talk about a few of those large-scale projects and what those might look like today as well. Um, in this example. On the far right, um, we have a parking lot. So you can see slight indentations along the edges of the greenery that sits in the middle that allows water to flow from the parking lot into this bioretention installation. And similarly, nature um, or the plants you see there, they're helping to capture some of that water, help to, helping to filter some of the sediment that brushes off or runs off of the sidewalk. Um, and, and that water is collected that way. Similarly, the goal is to keep that out of our natural water bodies and in Detroit, keep that out of our combined sewage system. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how collectively Sierra Club and Friends of the Rouge have engaged Detroiters in green stormwater infrastructure work, specifically through the Rain Gardens to the Rescue program. Rain Gardens to the Rescue program um, is a program that Friends of the Rudin Sierra Club co-lead. We've been doing this work collaboratively together informally since 2011, formally since 2015, um, and we are graciously funded by the Earth Family Foundation. We have a, um, th these images just give you a 
some slight insight into the kind of work that our program involves. So um, as you can imagine, it involves rain gardens, it involves native plants, and we install those gardens with volunteers. And so you can see um, a, a number of volunteers working on this installation in that photo on the bottom right. And since we've been doing this work, we have um, numerous gardens all across the city, represented in every single district in the city of Detroit. And you can see that outline here. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of, the pro pro some of the gardens we've installed in 2021, as well as a few of the gardens that we've installed in other years. And you all are so lucky today because we have some amazing past participants um, who are able to join us and they're willing to speak about their experience in the program. So I won't say too much more because I'm going to give them the floor um, to speak about that a little later in the presentation. But I do wanna give you all just a few of the highlights from our 2022 program. This year we were focused in District 6. And if you aren't familiar with the city's district map, that is what we would typically call um, the Southwest side of Detroit. Um, we were fortunate to install nine gardens total. We converted 1,300 square feet of lawn to native rain gardens, which is really exciting. Um, we were able to capture 3,250, capture water from 3,250 square feet of impervious surface. So um, in our program, we are connecting directly to folks downspouts. So we're capturing water from a portion of their roof and feeding that right into the garden. And if you all have any questions, again, please feel free to include them in the Q&A and we will answer them um, during the program. Collectively, the nine gardens that we install will hold up to 5,700 gallons of water every single time it rains. So though these are residential gardens and they may be um, smaller than some of the larger installations that we'll talk about when we highlight a few projects going on across the city of Detroit, they hold quite a bit of water. Um, and through this program, we were able to engage over 100 community members. They were able to either participate in a planting, they were able to learn from um, the participants who invited them to help them get this garden installed. Um, they were able to attend our classes and ask questions and learn more about not only rain gardens and why they're important, but also native plants and some of the co-benefits that those plants provide for our larger ecosystem. And so just one of our um, 2022 participants, this is Angela. Um, she and her family are avid gardeners. They had a lot of vegetable guard, uh, vegetable plants around and they were growing vegetables already um, and native plants. Angela was a native plant expert um, and had a really unique vision and wanted a lot of variety in her garden. And she wanted to take up most if not all of her front lawn. Um, it ended up being a good chunk of her front lawn when we were done talking to her in detail about her needs. And you can kind of see where her rain barrel is. That is the downspout that we connected to her garden. And this is the before photo. And this is the after. Um, so where Angela is standing, which is like right near the middle, um, you can see mulch. So we took her downspout buried it underground and connected it to this beautiful, beautiful rain garden. Um, these are all plant plugs. So they're pretty small the first year, but after the first year, they typically grow quite a bit. Um, Jackie, I don't know if you wanna add anything about the number of species she had. Um, Angela was unique in that she wanted a lot of variety in her garden, which was really exciting. Anything yeah, I can't remember how many in, um species we had. I think it was about 10. So we we definitely limited it down from we had a big list to start with. She wanted like one of everything, which we're totally excited for. But to make it easier for her to maintain at least the first couple of years, we said oh, maybe a, a fewer amount of species uh, would be a little bit easier. Um, but we're always so excited about how uh, gung-ho our rain gardeners are and um, and especially when we, you know, talk about all these different um, native plants, um, there's such a variety in like color, shape, um, what kind of pollinators they attract. So it doesn't surprise me that everyone was excited to 
trying to get as many different species as they can. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and the folks that you see pictured here with Angela, as I mentioned, we do all of these installs um, with volunteers. And so she was able to rely on her network of family and friends and colleagues to help bring this vision of her rain garden to life. And here is a quote from Angela, um, because I think she really says it best. I have wanted a rain garden for 10 years. And in June of this year, I was finally able to join the rain gardens to the rest join Rain Gardens to the Rescue for a free five-week class series in Southwest Detroit to learn more about rain gardens. I am grateful that I was able to receive assistance in installing my rain garden at home. I am excited to see my garden blooming for years to come. And so that just gives you an idea um, of just how excited people can be about their rain gardens and and in some cases, how long that they, they've been waiting and needing assistance to kind of get this vision moving forward. And so we are so happy to have been able to assist Angela um, in getting this garden in the ground. And we definitely look forward to keeping in touch with her and seeing how it blooms over the years. Yeah, and in the case of Angela's, um, like it said in her quote, she's been wanting one for like 10 years. And like Elaine mentioned, she's also a native plant expert. So it's just kind of having that that extra little push and a little education um, through our program uh, that really got her excited and ready for a rain garden. So it's always lovely to see as well. Yes, yes. So before we move to our segment um, where I where we invite past participants to speak, I do want to highlight one other program that Friends of the Rouge and Sierra Club are involved in. And um, it focuses on houses of worship. So in addition to Detroit having a combined sewage overflow system, we also have um, drainage fees that were charged per impervious acre and in the city of Detroit. And that program was revamped a few years ago to make sure that everyone was being charged an equal amount. Um, but with the restructuring of that came some challenges for certain houses of worship where um, they have very large buildings, they have large parking lots, and they have smaller congregations. And so um, the flat rate that they're charged per impervious acre doesn't necessarily always align with the amount of money that they're bringing in, but we recognize that houses of worship are very important community hubs, um, not only for members of that particular house of worship, but for the surrounding community that they serve. Um, and one of the ways that we're Collaborating to help address some of the issues houses of worship are facing um, is through National Wildlife Federation's Sacred Grounds Program. So the Sacred Grounds Program is a national program run by National Wildlife Federation. Um, the goal is, of that program is to increase pollinator habitat and engage houses of worship around poll pollinator habitat expansion. Um, and in Detroit, we have the unique opportunity to both increase pollinator habitat and also help houses of worship who are struggling with that monthly drainage fee. And so National Wildlife Federation, Sierra Club and Friends of the Rouge have partnered in the Detroit area to address some of those challenges with houses of worship. Um, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about the program. I just do wanna let you all know that it exists. Uh, this is a garden that we installed at Mary Grove this summer, um, and this was a great example of a, of a faith-based institution that was looking for a way to help offset some of the costs of their drainage fees while beautifying the campus. Um, the, the Mary Grove campus is home to both a public school as well as several nonprofit organizations who are operating out of um, various buildings on the campus, and a number of volunteers were able to give their time to help this vision come to life. So if you all are ever in Northwest Detroit, I encourage you all to stop by the Mary Grove campus and see this new beautiful installation. Um, maybe not right now because it probably doesn't look too green as it does in these photos, but in the spring and throughout the summer next year, you will really be able to see the growth of this, this project. And can I just add about the Mary Grove project? Yeah. Um, if you see the, the top left photo, and how many downspouts they have uh, on such a large building. Um, this was kind of like a little service area, kind of hidden away behind the building, um, where there was a lot of downspouts just kind of being um, directed to. So they got a lot of water back there. Um, 
And where we ended up planting was just kind of like this regular grass. Um, so this was a great way to not only manage that stormwater um, going into the area, but to add beauty and color. Um, it's right outside of um, the whole buildings like cafeteria. So it's gonna be enjoyed all year round. Yeah, the other great thing about the particular location of this garden is that some of the offices look into this middle space. Um, and so now there's additional visual interest for folks who are working in the building. They can look outside and see this beautiful garden. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, and then one other project is the Jesu Catholic Church and School Gardens. They have two gardens, one on the east and one on the west. These are first year pictures. This garden is a bit older now um, and it's definitely filled in quite a bit. But similarly, if you are ever in Northwest Detroit, I encourage you all to stop by and, and check out these installations. And a few more photos, um, large installations, like the one at Jezu, uh, typically draw a lot of questions. And so those installations, when we install them, we always accompany a large sign that details the function. So it tells a little bit about what a rain garden is and some of the common plants you might see um, in a rain garden. So if anyone is in interested in more information about Sacred Grounds, um, the program lead for that, her name is Tiffany Jones, um, Tiffany Jones now, and we can update her email in the chat, but the website for that is nwf.org backslash sacred grounds. And now I wanna move to a more in-depth look at GSI. And, and for that, I'm going to welcome um, a few of our past participants to talk about their experience, either um, getting a garden installed and why they chose to do that, or talking about their experience maintaining a garden now that they're several years out of the formal Rain Gardens to the Rescue program. And um, the first case is going to be a look at some neighborhood challenges associated with GSI. So it's typically rare um, that folks are experiencing flooding or like water pooling and isolation. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Jackie to give us a little background on this first example. Or, yep on this first example. Wonderful, so our first example here um, is a garden that we installed through the Rain Gardens to the Rescue program uh, just last year in 2021. Um, this is John's garden. These are his beautiful renditions uh, of his garden plants. Uh, if you can't tell, he is somewhat of a fantastic artist. Um, so we love showing these ones and all the color. Um, it's a fairly simple design. Um, in the front of his house, um, and it kind of, it goes nicely with the plants that they already had, um, so we really do like to um, kind of seamlessly integrate um, rain gardens with traditional landscaping as well um, to help, um, you know, be more appealing um, and just kind of show uh, neighbors that, you know, they don't need um, specifically um, a rain garden that's just kind of all by itself, it can really easily be incorporated into existing landscapes. So if we want to show the next photos. So uh, here on the left is John's garden. Once we got finished installing it with our wonderful volunteers, uh, I believe that was in August. Um, and then on the right uh, in 2021, later in the summer, uh, we got some heavy rains. This is a lovely photo that John sent us out of his front window showing how much uh, water his garden is already holding. Um, and with the comparison of how much water is on the adjacent road right outside his home as well. Um, so we, we think that's a nice, really powerful um, example uh, showing a rain garden in action. Uh, and then here we also have um, two more updated photos of John's garden. Uh, the one on the left is. Um, a beautiful blooming garden in the summer. We have some butterfly weeds, some purple cone flower. Uh, I think there's a blazing star in there too. Um, and then the one on the right uh, was one he sent me maybe just about a week ago. He put some more mulch down um, and he left the, the dead stalks for our native plants, um, which are really great habitat um, for over, overwintering insects as well. Um, so not only are these uh, native gardens wonderful habitat and food and shelter for pollinators, 
um, in the summer and the spring, but also in the fall and the winter. So a rain garden is always doing its job. Awesome. And I just want to flag the, the photo that we just showed you, which I might be able to go back to. No, I can't. Okay. The photo that we just, yeah, here we go. Right. This is 2021 on the left. This is 2022 on the left. So just to give you an idea of how much um, a garden can fill in in just one year. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a ton of plants right away. You don't have to be worried that your plants look small right away. In just one year, you can see um, an amazing amount of plants fill in. So don't be afraid to use plant plugs, um, which are, are a great way to kind of, one, know what you planted um, versus like if you were to plant from seed, which can get complicated. Um, because you might not be sure what's a weed as it comes up versus what is a seedling. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to use plant plugs. They typically work really well and you can, it, it'll just take about one season for your garden to begin to really fill in. And next we have another example. Um, Jackie, I don't know if you want to intro this one at all. Sure, or yeah. Um, so we're going to introduce, introduce uh, Betsy in just a moment, um, but I'm going to have Elaine uh, share a video that Betsy sent us uh, before we put in a rain garden, just to kind of show um, that stormwater um, might not just be your problem, it could also end up being your neighbor's problem. So um, again, this is in southwest Detroit, so the homes are uh, relatively close together, um, and I'll let Elaine play that and uh, kind of show what's happening here. So it's showing a lot of pooling in between the homes. Um, there is some hard walkways. Um, they have really large roofs. Uh, luckily, there are some nice large trees um, on Betsy's property as well uh, that do catch a lot of rain. Um, but when all of that water is kind of being um, not really managed um, in this case, um, if she was having problems seepage into the basement, um, but uh, luckily we were able to um, kind of resolve these issues. Um, but uh, again, I'll let um, uh, Elaine introduce Betsy uh, and she can kind of um, speak to a little bit about her garden, her problems, and hopefully the solutions that the, the rain garden has brought her. Awesome. Betsy, I would like to wel welcome Betsy um, to share a little bit more about what her challenges were, and then what her approach was to um, her, her rain garden solution. She installed a rain garden that is large, uh, typic, like a little larger than what people are typically willing to do. And so it would be awesome um, if Betsy could share a little about that de decision process as well. Betsy, the floor sure. is yours. Hi. Um, yes. So, um, this is me in my front yard and we did we had a, we were having water in the basement um not pooling water but just dampness um and so the 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 we did several things to address that rain garden being just like one piece of that puzzle um so we did decide to turn our whole yard into a rain garden also because you know we weren't very um doing very well with grass anyway, but this, you can tell on the left here, this um, this here is a French drain that my partner dug out um, all the side, all along the side of the house. So it wasn't just the downspouts. It was, it was like a canal all along the bottom of the house. Or right, it's a, it starts out like 18 inches and goes down three feet. So this is extra. This is like above and beyond what is required for a rain garden. But what I would say is like, whatever you put into it is what you'll get out of it. So we decided we wanted a bigger garden and we um, we have three hours of planting. So we're gonna do a bunch of digging ahead of time, um, which saved us some effort so that we could help my neighbor, Gloria, pictured on the right here, who also participated in the program. Um, so we could work together on our, our you know community water problems. And you can see along, like the fence in each of these photos is back to back. So alongside her fence and alongside my fence um, is where we directed the water to go. And um, 
I also got these rocks on Craigslist that we could include in the um, design, which I think is something you can always do if you don't want to do like the mulch board or you can you can get creative, you can put extra stuff in and you know Craigslist or is always there's always like free stuff if you're willing to go and pick it up and cart it over. <laughs> um, so we had friends and neighbors come and help us dig it up. And I really wasn't sure if we could get both gardens done, but we did it within the three hours, which I think is really impressive. Um, and yeah. And yeah. I just want to highlight here that the difference in scale, right? So Betsy had a very different ap approach than her neighbor, Gloria. Um, Betsy wanted to go all in. She was interested in her entire yard being a part of her garden. Gloria, um, Gloria Betsy's neighbor, it told me, she, like, I don't have a green thumb. I'm not sure about this. Um, what can we do that gives me a smaller footprint to manage? Um, and we'll also see this, well, you can't tell from the photos, but when we planted, Betsy also wanted a lot more species, whereas Gloria wanted a more uniform look to her garden. And so we were able to accommodate that by planting just two species, yet both gardens um, are, are working to fix the shared issue that they had. So both houses were experiencing water pooling in the middle. Um, the gardens are two different sizes, but both, regardless of size, right? Each one plays an important role in helping to manage the stormwater. And, I and would I'll say show like, the plants next. And I would, yeah, Gloria wanted more of like a formal, like straight lines, very like um, standard. And I was going for more of a natural look and they were both accommodated. <laughs> yes, awesome. Thank you so much for that, Betsy. Um, anything else that you want to add? Um, I would just say that we were able to get trees and I was really a tree and I was really excited about the elderberry tree and the red stick dogwoods as like larger plants that were also possible. Yes. Yeah. And that's a great flag, right? So it's not um, always about flowers. Sometimes um, shrubs can also be good solutions for managing water. Um, Betsy's garden also had a number of grasses like up in the corner where that person is standing with a white bucket, those are all grasses. Um, so those are also options as you, you all are thinking about rain gardens and, and planting them of your planting one of your own. And so here are the final products for each one. Um, so Gloria's, which runs along her fence line, and then Betsy's, which is her entire front yard, just to give you all an idea of um, how you can imagine a rain garden in your own space. Thank you so much, Betsy, for hopping on and, and joining us and sharing your experience. Yes, thank you, Betsy. I think there's one more photo on that slide. Yes. Um, and as a nice, like, nice photo of both gardens side by side, big or small, rain gardens for all. Yes. And we are getting some good questions. I just want to let you know that we see them and we're going to get to them at the end. Um, but we're going to invite a few more people to speak before we do that. Um, Jackie, I will pass it to you to intro Carolyn's project. Wonderful. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide, show a photo. So um, in 2021, um, we had uh, one of our rain garden principals, uh, Carolyn Pruitt. Uh, who lives here on Hartford Street. Um, this is a photo she sent us, <clears throat> excuse me, um, showing the flooding issue that her and her neighbors um, have on their street. Um, so obviously no one wants to trek through all this water just to get to their car. Um, so um, she first put in a, um, a rain garden along her home on Hartford Street um, and then um, we started working with her for a larger project um, on some of the vacant lots um, right adjacent to her home um, for this beautiful um, community green space. Um, so here uh, up now we have a, a rendering um, of our plans uh, for the garden. Uh, so this is a memorial park to Carolyn's mother uh, who was also a um, a big um, community member um, and kind of like the mother for, for the whole street. 
um, who unfortunately passed away um, from cancer back in 20, uh, 2007. Um, so this is a memorial park uh, for Lamita. Um, as you can tell um, by the beautiful little walkway there, uh, she was a big fan of Prince. Um, so we have uh, that pathway uh, currently incorporated uh, into the lots, um, along with some beautiful native pollinator flowers. Um, and in the coming year, we are hoping to add a rain garden piece um, to manage that storm water um, directly off of the street. Um, so one of the issues with that one that we've um, kind of run into uh, with this project um, was that the height of the, um, the lot was a lot higher than where the road is. Um, so unfortunately, um, water doesn't like to go upwards very easily. Um, so just, um, we have our wonderful landscape architects on our team um, that have brainstormed um, really creative ways of uh, getting that water to flow downwards to the garden. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, here is a photo uh, earlier this year um, where we were planting the, um, the native pollinator uh, species around uh, the Prince Walkway there. Um, and we will be doing a ribbon cutting um, for the uh, Memorial Park um, this upcoming April. So mark your calendars, April 22nd. Uh, we'd love to have you out, show you the space, show you all of our plans and uh, have you learn more about it and hopefully get hands on uh, helping us install this beautiful park as well. Awesome. And next, I would like to invite Danny. Um, Danny, if you have a few words about either your experience in the program or um, your rain garden, we would love to welcome you. And I also want to shout out Danny. Um, we Earlier this spring, uh, we did a GSI bike tour uh, with Eastside Community Network. Uh, Danny was our fearless leader, showing us all the wonderful GSI uh, across um, the East Side. Um, and I'll let him speak more about that and a wonderful app where you can um, kind of tour these locations yourself as well. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Good. I didn't know it was 2017. I thought it was 2018. It's been that long, huh? I think it was 2018. Sorry for that. <laughs> well, no, it was, I, it, was 20, it was 2019. 2019, okay. We're yeah, we enough. both was 2019. That's right. <laughs> Can't keep them straight anymore. Yeah, it's okay. I, I'll take 2017. Anyway, them, them plants right there is a lot bigger than they are now. They were small when they started out, but that whole front yard was full of plants. And I, uh, I, I had a chance to do the other side, but you'll have a picture of it because I got two downsprouts coming to the front. So I did the other side with, with, uh, with the plants that was left over from, uh, from that year. So I was able to put two together. So I was like a dual uh, rain garden set up. And one thing is I noticed, uh, that's why I did a tour of rain garden, that it's a hard sell with your neighbors if they haven't went through the educational part. They see that as a flower garden, not a rain garden. So when I try to sell it to them and tell them it starts at the gutters and go to the downsprouts, and then when I start talking about the native plants, that's where they just, they just, I just lose them because they can't connect all of that. But they don't have no picture of what I'm talking about because it's mostly on the ground then. So that's why I decided to do a, do a tour, especially with ECM, because they did some stormwater management in the neighborhood too a few years ago. So we decided to get together and do tours with all the stormwater management projects here on the Lower East Side. And there's a lot of them. And uh, like I said, we didn't get a chance to go to all of them because we should have had that tour on Saturday instead of doing a weekday. But hopefully next year we have that tour on Saturday so that we can go to all the projects around the neighborhood. Because a lot of people that don't even know when they walk by some of these G uh, GSI projects, what they are. So it's just a matter of educating the public. And uh, you know, if we do it more education I guess if you had more commercials going, it would work a little bit more better. But that's the one thing I, I can say. I got one neighbor, hopefully she'll go through the program next year, who identified my rain garden as rain garden. Out of all my neighbors in my neighborhood. But uh, that's what's going on. So uh, I do have an app for that. It's called, uh, what's it called? Pocket Sites. You go on Pocket Sites on your app store, 
then you see one of the, you see the, the whole uh, route for the uh, GSI uh, bicycle tour that we uh, did this year. We didn't get a chance to do all of them, but I got it on that site. You, it's free to download from the App Store. And it's, uh, it's very educational because it was designed just to educate people. That's my biggest thing is to try to educate people how this works with stormwater management. Because in the rural area, they know all about it. But uh, up here in this urban area, this is brand new to us. Yes, thank you so much for that, Danny. The tour that you put together this summer was awesome. Um, it was so great to see so many of the projects, some that I had seen photos of, but I hadn't gotten a chance to visit yet in person. Um, so thank you again for that. And everyone should check out Danny's app um, and, and see a, a little bit about the route for, that we took for that bike tour, which was really awesome. And yes, I agree, next year on Saturday, that way we have more time. And here's a, another look at Danny's garden, still from that very first year. Um, as he mentioned, the plants are a lot bigger now, and you saw from John's garden just how quickly those plants can fill in. And I think if you download um, that app that Danny was talking about, I believe he has his updated garden photo on there, too. So if you want to see how big those plants have gotten, I highly recommend checking out that app. Yes, yeah, good flag. Um, and next, I would like to invite Loretta, whose garden was also installed in 2019, to talk about her experience. Hi, my name is Loretta, and I decided to do a butterfly-shaped rain garden um, in my yard. I was very excited that I was able to design my own rain garden, because I didn't know um, we was able to do that. So um, I have got many compliments about um, the rain gardens and asked what type of flowers we have in the rain garden. And the rain garden really was the tr first transformation of the neighborhood of my um, street becoming, um, looking better to beautify the, the neighborhood. So the rain garden started it all. It was the first start of um, people talking to each other, neighbors is getting to know each other. Um, it, even for me, it was me getting closer to my neighbors because we had something to talk about. So the butterfly rain garden really was the transformation of us becoming, building a strong relationship with each other. So I was very excited about that. And that's my granddaughters. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Loretta. I'm going to cl click through because I have a few more pictures okay. um, of your garden. And I, I heard that you decorated it for the holidays. I don't have those photos, but please tell us about it because it sounds awesome. Oh, okay. I used to decorate my um rain, my butterfly rain garden um, for the season. So right now and for Christmas, I got a reindeer. I got some presents in front of it, some garland in front of it. And then I have, um what else I got in there? Oh, some bells I do. So I usually go with the season. Whatever the season is, I change the rain garden and put decorations up for this. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anything okay. else that you want to add before we keep going? Um, it's important for everybody to have a rain garden because rain gardens help with infrastructure and it just um, save money on your water bill. So it's just get a rain garden to help the butterflies. Oh yeah, the beautiful butterflies come back into the neighborhood and different. I mean, I've seen so many beautiful butterflies since I have this rain garden and bees. So definitely um, rain garden is thumbs up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Loretta. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Betsy. Um, it has been great to hear more about your experiences and how you've been able to kind of keep the conversation going, um, keep the conversation going even after having had your garden installed. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to breeze Definitely. through these next couple of slides in the interest of time. I want to make sure that we get to you all's questions. Um, so one example that you may also see, um, this is an example of a green roof. This is just a thumbnail pic picture of a larger video um, that I will not share in the interest of time, but we will be able to share these slides after the webinar if folks are interested. Um, this was installed on a small business that was located in District 6. That particular business has since closed, um, but the video details 
like why they chose to go with the green roof, what the green roof would do and shows you kind of what that installation looks like. And so I encourage you all to check that out if you're interested. Um, and the project details are available on the Detroit Stormwater Hub. So DetroitStormwater.org is the website for the Detroit Stormwater Hub where you can find a number of green stormwater infrastructure projects across the city of Detroit, whether they be residential projects, um, like some of the ones we've talked about today or large, more formal projects like the ones that um, are highlighted through the green roof example. Um, another example that a lot of folks don't know about, but is very easy to see um, in, in front of the Charles H. Wright Museum in their turnaround, they have a permeable paper installed. So that dark gray circle that you see um, is an image. It makes an image of a Sankofa, which is a bird um, in African culture uh, or a symbol in African culture that means um, you have to Essentially, it means you have to understand your history in order to move forward. And so the beak of that bird points at the door of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History um, and just symbolizes, right, the, the history that is embodied in that building. And so it's a really nice example of where art meets green stormwater infrastructure. And like Danny said, a lot of times people don't even know they're looking at green infrastructure. It can be masked. Um, either as pavers or it just looks like a flower garden. Um, but this is a really unique and different example of how um, it can be both functional and beautiful. Um, and to learn more about any projects across the city of Detroit, you can visit the Detroit Stormwater Hub. It has a, a number of projects, those led by Detroit Water and Sewage Department, as well as private business entities um, and some other private homeowners or private non or nonprofit institutions. So definitely check that out for more information. Um, and then I just wanna give uh, a, a brief peek into what is happening in 2023. So um, Rain Gardens to the Rescue, we are, Hosting the program again, the applications will be available in March. It is a public course that folks are welcome to join if you're interested in learning how to install your own rain garden. Um, this year, we are focusing on folks in Detroit, zip code 48217. Uh, Dearborn South End Thank you. and <laughs> the city of River Rouge. Yes. So we are, this is the first year that we're kind of expanding uh, officially outside of um, the city limits of Detroit. Um, so we've had a lot of interest um, from people like across the watershed, of course, that want to learn and install rain gardens. Um, but if you know anyone in these particular communities, um, I highly recommend um, that you let them know about our rain gardens rescue program. Um, we'll have more information uh, up on that website uh, as we get it. Um, and of course, um, the application will be for receiving a garden. Um, but the educational course is free and open to the public. Um, so if you know anyone that just wants to learn more about rain gardens, um, we, we invite everyone that, is, that would like to come. Yes. Um, and and then, then we also have our uh, master rain gardener course. Um, this is with Friends of the Rouge and multiple other partners. We've actually expanded that program uh, to be more of a uh, regional one as well. So we have, um, um, Washtenaw and Oakland County, um, the Clinton uh, Watershed, Huron Watershed, uh, Ecorse Creek, uh, so kind of expanding it to that whole Southeast Michigan area. Um, but again, with that one, uh, it is virtual. So, if, you know, anyone who lives anywhere that wants to learn about rain gardens, uh, they can definitely join us for the Master Rain Gardener course. Um, that one does cost some money um, to join. Uh, but we do have some scholarship options available as well. Um, if you'd like to know more about those, um, I highly suggest going to the website or you can feel free to email me. Uh, my email is um, earlier in the presentation. Um, that class uh, will begin um, in February. So we're gonna be learning about rain gardens this winter and uh, ready to start digging them by the spring. Awesome. So now we are going to um, answer a couple of questions. I'm going to start with this question because it's it's a fun question. Um, so to the presenters, what are your favorite varieties of grasses that you've added to your gardens? 
Um, I love Purple Love Grass. I found it doing work with Rain Gardens to the Rescue. I am obsessed with it. I think it's so subtle, um, but so cute. Like it's just a cute grass. <laughs> um, Jackie, do you have a favorite? I really like the prairie drop seed. Um, I'm really thinking about incorporating it into my garden as well. Uh, it stays like in a nice little, um, cute little fountainy uh, little grass clump. Um, I think that one's really cool. I'm really interested to see how Betsy's um, gets um, this next coming spring. I know she had some blue-eyed grass. That one was a newer one for me. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that one looks as well. Awesome. Um, let's see, our next question is, how were the rain gardens affected by this summer's drought? So yes, it was a definitely a dry summer, especially compared to the one we had last year. Um, for the new gardens, it definitely meant there was more watering than what would have normally been required just to make sure that the plants got enough water to really get established. Um, typically with a rain garden, once you install it, you don't have to water it. The part of the reason that we plant with native plants is because of the length of their roots. So while our standard grass that you might have in your lawn has roots of three to four inches, um, native plants have roots that can be up to more than 12 feet deep, right? So part of that power is that they're able to reach deeper areas of the ground and tap um, groundwater for additional watering needs. Native plants are also suited to deal with the traditional Michigan climate, and so they're a little better adjusted than um, some of the other plants that you could use for a rain garden. Um, but occasionally, depending on how our climate continues to change, there may be instances where folks need to water more or, or less, um, depending on how things go. Jackie, anything you want to add there? Um, nope, nothing to add there. Okay, perfect. Um, our next question asks, what can I do about a rain garden that is not thriving? My garden is about four years old and it still isn't filling out. There's more shade in my yard than I realized when I designed it. I'll let Jackie start with this one. Sure, and Irma or uh, Cindy, feel free to, um, to give any opinions as well. Um, Alice, it's great to have you on. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to hear that your, uh, your garden isn't doing as well. Um, it may be dependent on the, the plants that we chose. Like you said, um, if it's a little bit more shady um, than the plants we selected, um, that could be the issue. Um, I don't think the issue would necessarily be like lack of water or anything like that, because um, like Elaine was saying, um, once they're established, they usually reach pretty far down and can uh, kind of tap into the groundwater. Um, Cindy or Irma, do you have any suggestions? Hey, Elise. <clears throat> yeah, if, if the plants aren't filling in nicely, maybe we do need to consider some adding in some more shade tolerant species. And um, I'd be happy to provide you with some information on some, what those might be. Yeah, and feel free to, to send us over some photos. Um, sometimes a picture speaks a thousand words um, and we can kind of to help you out from there. But yes, we want all of our gardens to survive and thrive um, so that they are um, doing the job that they need to. You know, I have a garden similar to that where um, I have some huge trees, um, but I mean, it, maybe trimming the trees back a little bit, perhaps pruning the tree might help bring a little bit more sunshine to the space. Something if, if possible. That's a great suggestion, Irma. And that is one thing um, that you might wanna keep in mind um, when you're planning for a rain garden or anything like that. Um, is just like the, the factors around it. So yeah, if you have trees, if they're large trees, um, or um, the opposite case, like if you have a neighbor with a tree and they decide to cut it down and now your, your little garden area is like full sun. Um, so there's definitely some things uh, that can change over time um, and just being able to, uh, yeah, kind of identify um, when those things are happening, um, the new site conditions, um, 
And sometimes even the, the garden itself changes, plants will kind of move to other places um, or fill in, or even sometimes you'll get seeds from, you know, birds just flying over too. So there's always a, a million things that could uh, affect your garden as well. Yes. Awesome. And there's, we are at four o'clock, but there's one quick question that we can answer. Um, and it's in regards to the type of mulch that is best for a rain garden. Um, so you really want to use a triple shredded mulch. Your standard wood chips won't uh, be small enough. Like when water comes into the garden, they might float and move around, which is going to impact your erosion. But a triple shredded mulch is um, shred it in a way that when water comes in, it doesn't really move the mulch around as much. So you want to look for triple shredded mulch as you are installing and um, re-mulching your gardens. And with that, I would like to thank everyone so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, it was great to be able to showcase some of the projects that we've installed this year. And if you all have any questions, I'll flip back to the initial slide that had my email as well as Jackie's email. Um, but we thank you for spending time with us this evening and hope to engage with you all this summer. Thank you. Thanks. And we have recorded today's session. Um, so you can either uh, view the playback on our Facebook page um, or we'll be um, uh, linking this on the um, uh, Rain Gardens to the Rescue, Friends of the Rouge uh, website page as well. Awesome, thank you all. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.